the voice of Sherry. Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. And you are here with uh, at uh, the ASEAN Dailies, where we deliver news from Southeast Asia. So we are here at uh, to um, share the news on the Putrajaya, where they bought spyware from hacking team, and it's leaked. Uh, 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 apparently, there is a leaked info that showed. So this information online revealed that Malaysian um, government was among the the country's bank service uh, from uh, Milan-based hackers. And this hacking team, who have been uh, selling software to this repressive government to spy on their citizens as well. So. When it comes to government information or such, it is very important to double check and or, or even to to uh, have the mechanism or system that make sure that this kind of a, a spyware or any kinds of uh, forms of software wouldn't be able to hack into. But this was revealed after this hacking team uh, became the victim of a major hack over the weekend and where the this leaked information, including the client list uh, and then uh, other inf very important information was posted on its Twitter feed. And one of the uh, the software purchased by the Malaysians was the Da Vinci Remote Control System, uh, which is also Trojan horse, that tricks the victim into opening it. So where after that, the software is able to track and eavesdrop and also download information uh, from the victim's infected device. And this Da Vinci's capabilities, apparently it includes the ability to copy files uh, from the computer's hard disk, record uh, Skype calls, emails, instant messages, as well as the passwords that tap into the, the web browser. And uh, the other capabilities of this is to turn on the uh, device a webcam and a microphone to spy on the target as well. So these are the quite uh, sort of uh, easier to get the, all this information when it comes to hacking system. And it is better to have uh, some kind of mechanism or even better software to block uh, and also prevent from the, uh, the future uh, uh, protection and the future uh, any kinds of the being hacked by other teams or ad community. We're moving on. Uh, this is just an update. Uh, World Street Journal releases the re, uh, redacted documents online to back up its one MDB Najib money trail report. And uh, this has been going on for some time and the Najib uh, has been uh, denying the fact that uh, how do I use uh, this money for my personal account. However, uh, Wall Street Journal has been standing firm on its own feet. So but as Malaysian authorities investigate this money trail uh, implicating the Tuxari Najib Rajak, uh, the Wall Street Journal released uh, a batch of documents on the internet that purportedly shows that how nearly 2.6 billion ringgit was moved from one MDB into a, into his personal bank account. So that's the big question here. And where has uh, money gone exactly? Under the flow chart and the bank documents uploaded by this uh, famous news journal related to transactions in uh, March 2013, December 14, and February 2015 that uh, ended up in the Najib's account. So how did it happen and who did it if it, if really it's not a uh, prime minister? And in the alleged 2013 transaction, the flow chart uh, by the Malaysian investigator showed the British uh, Virgin Island company Tenor Finance Corp transferring ar about 620 US dollar million as well as six 61 million dollar to an uh, 
um, arm bank, Islamic arm bank, account properly belonging to Najibs. That was on the March 21st and March 25th. And uh, Wall Street Journal had previously described that this time frame as heated campaign period ahead of Malaysia's May 5th, which was the general elections in 2013. And the addition of that is the alleged 2014 fund transfers. The flowchart showed that uh, SRC International transferring about 40 million ringgit out of its uh, Islamic bank account to Kanigada Montari uh, Sandy Berhard, where it was majority stakeholder on December 24th, which in turn it transferred uh, to Isan Perdana uh, Sandy Berhard, a fake bank account on the same day. So this document purports to show uh, the depositing about 27 million uh, million uh, ringgit and also 5 million ringgit into the Islamic bank under uh, Prime Minister's name on 26th, which was 26th of December, which was just last year. So there are quite a number of information. Uh, it's been just uh, discovered and investigated by a uh, Wall Street Journal and those information it looks like it can't be faked and we need to take a sort of irresponsibility uh, responses from here so all this uh, number of flow chart were accompanied either by the scanned copies of remittance transaction slips or completed remittance forms for the fund transfers so a January 2014 letter on the power of this attorney over the three bank accounts under this Islamic bank of Ahad that Wall Street Journal said it belongs to uh, Prime Minister Najib. And it was the oldest information that the letter was provided. And uh, well, but however, the last, uh, the few digits of the three banks account were rejected along with other details in the documents that, that was uploaded by Wall Street Journal. So this Malay Mail Online was uh, unable to uh, independently verify the authority, uh, authenticity sorry, of these documents at the same time of writing. And in fact, just the last uh, week, uh, the Wall Street Journal claimed the money trail showed that about 700 US dollars, million, uh, uh, 700 million US dollars, were moved between the government agencies, banks, companies before it ended up in the Prime Minister's Dr. Sari Najib, uh, Najib Rajak's account. And also, in addition to that, the US uh, daily claim to have cited this document uh, from Malaysian's investigators currently uh, scrutinizing the troubled, uh, this very controversial issue on MDB and adding that these were the basis of the, this report. So those who also signed this joint statement at the Bank Nigora Governor, Tan Sri Jetty, Dr. Aziz, Inspector General of Police Tansri Khalid Abdubagar, and also Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission Chef Commissioner Tansri Abu Qasim Mohammed. So uh, still, a Prime Minister is denying to take money for personal gain and they categorized as allegations and political sabotage. Well, we will be uh, expecting more news and apparently uh, Wall Street Journal uh, one that the uh, prime minister was expected to file a suit against uh, this Wall Street Journal, and uh, let's see how it goes like because the image of Malaysia and all uh, the information that it has been uh, released from other agencies. Now we are at the point that we can't feel what to believe and. We just sort of have to follow and just keep updating ourselves with uh, this news and see where the, uh, the Prime Minister goes with his own directions. So uh, I will be back after this short break. Stay tuned for the uh, other section of ASEAN Dailies where we'll be focusing on uh, our political news. And you are still with the Grace from Durian ASEAN. <laughs> ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. 
Welcome back to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. And you are with Grace at ASEAN Dailies. We deliver news from Southeast Asia. And now we are at the segment where we deliver news and also discuss on the political aspect of Southeast Asia. So we are uh, we'll be talking about uh, what's going on uh, in USA as well as what they have been doing uh, against uh, China. So apparently Obama is working to make a Vietnam an ally against to China. So 40 years after the fall of the Saigon, the President Barack Obama is seeking to configure, reconfigure a historically uh, difficult relationship with Vietnam into strategic partnership against China. And there the historical uh, the relationship between China and uh, Vietnam it's been really sour and also the tension is just uh, getting worse and worse at this point so for Obama the meeting comes as he has engaged in a new diplomatic overtures to a series of long-time US uh, adversaries including Cuba Iran and Burma as well and administration's officers described this strong as the most pow- powerful person in Vietnam's one-party leadership structure and uh, the oldest behind-scenes figure who has uh, significantly influenced uh, in political decision-making as well. So Trong, uh, who is a par- party sh- uh, chef, has traditionally been a more conservative element of the leadership and also uh, 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 they, he has been building some kind of his own image when it comes to leadership in the tr- uh, conservatism. So getting Trump to support to, to move forward on the, the uh, TPP trade uh, and also other U.S.-led initiatives is a very, very important, important and a crucial that uh, he was not actually uh, authorized to talk on the record and also spoke on the condition of uh, anonymity. However, uh, having uh, Vietnam on the U.S. side and also to fight against China, it will be something for China because, well, uh, Vietnam uh, was always a sort of... Uh, I wouldn't say under China, but then have been having pressure uh, because of China. And now with the backup support from USA, uh, it is very difficult to see how China will react because it all also involves the uh, TPP trade agreement and we also has RCEP and AIIB. So with all this tra- free trade agreement going on, as well as the Vietnam uh Perhaps agreeing uh, to with the Obama suggestion to make ally against China. Uh, perhaps the, we have to look at more in the relationship and how it will affect the as in the nation wise in the future. And uh, moving on, uh, there are 14 students arrested for staging a political gathering in uh, uh, defense of the, the National Council for Peace and Order, uh, were ordered released on the Tuesday, which was just yesterday, by Bangkok Military Court. And the court's denial of the extension had been expected to follow this pressure and also criticism from several groups of the rights advocates, and both inside the country and as well as abroad. And these 14 students were arrested uh, on June 26th of this year on charges of defying uh, this NCPO, National Council for Peace and Order, uh, uh, and issued on the Section 44 of uh, interim constitution prohibiting the political assembly of five people or more and also for violating section 116 of the criminal code as well so this uh, uh the students are uh, definitely they were uh, arrested for something they've done a uh, uh gain i mean at staging the political gathering in the bangkok and well, talking about the Bangkok, uh, there has been a lot of issues going on, especially after this Thailand that the whole the government shift. So this kind of the movement, the student government will appear again and again. And it is pretty a worrisome. And also the question here is how many people in Thailand do care about what's uh, really important and what's going on in the country itself? And apparently, uh, if it is uh, they're arrested, uh, the charges carry sentences up to seven years in prison as well. 
Apparently, they were taken uh, before the Bangkok military court, uh, and the police submitted a request for the court permission to detain them for another 12 days. And, but the, the military court rejected the request on the ground that the student had not tried to flee and that there was no reason to detain them further. So they continued uh, detention and it would make it difficult for the student to prepare the case to defend themselves in court. So on uh, of the 14th, around 13 male students were to be taken back to the Bangkok Remand Prison and the sole uh, female student to the Central Women uh, Correctional Institution where they would be officially released later, later perhaps today hopefully. And moving on to the next news, which is about uh, Cambodia, that judge quits Cambodia's uh, trouble, uh, Kamal Rouge trials of uh, Phnom Penh. So this international judge announced that his resign resignation from the UN-backed war crime trials in Cambodia, and that this is the fourth to quit so far, and another perhaps a uh, blow for the troubled uh, a tribunal prominent uh, of the 1970s, this regime that has been going on. So Prime Minister Hun Sen, the former Khmer Rouge soldier, has won more trials could cause the anarchy and also return to civil war. And he has promised to thwart the new uh, indictment and also once said he would be very happy if you went packed up and also left. So this decade, uh, decade old, the tribunal has so far delivered a verdict of involving three high-profile leaders uh, from uh, 1975 to 1979, uh, the Killing Fields era, and it time to pursue uh, more cases have been met by this strong government resistance. So uh, that's the end of the political aspect of Southeast Asia. But still stay tuned. We'll be delivering more news on the uh, economic side of Southeast Asia after this break. <music> ASEAN Dailies First and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. And now, this morning, you are with Grace at ASEAN Dailies, where the little news from Southeast Asia. Now, we are at the session where we will be discussing and then uh, delivering news on economic aspect uh, from ASEAN. So, we'll travel to, to Indonesia, where labor unions have rejected the government's plan to revise the new pen pension scheme regulations uh, and also have urged it to protect the basic rights of workers across the country, which, in fact, uh, the President Joko Widodo have been, he has been working on for some time. And after this happened after mounting criticism from the House of Representatives, a commission uh, uh, the sixth overseeing labor issues and also labor unions following the insurance of government regulation, which is number 46 uh, uh, slash 2015, which stipulates that workers can withdraw their pension funds only after 10 years of enrollment in the program. And uh, like I mentioned, the President uh, Jokowi uh, announced, uh, which was just last week, that schemes did not apply to contract workers or those who re uh, resigned from their jobs. So this co uh, Confederation of Indonesia Workers Union, or KSBI, chairman said uh, the minimum enrollment requirement of, of 10 years should be scrapped from the, this new regulation and all workers, regardless of their employment and contract, should be able to directly withdraw their all age benefit, which is GST fund, without having to wait that long. So 10 years after you have this contract to the, to the company and you have to work there for 10 years just to get this benefit fund for their life, which to them it sounds very unfair. And under this previous pension fund regulation, 
workers could withdraw their money after perhaps just five years enrollment in the program, as mandated by 1992 Social Security law, the basis for the old Social Security programs. And if the revision only accommodates laid-off workers, then it is very certain that workers will reject it because this is against what workers have demanded regarding the pension fund regulations. And in fact, the workers, they have made three demands regards of the pension program, with the primary demand being that they be able to withdraw the benefit without any delay, because GST is aimed at uh, helping workers with the urgent needs in the future. And the second demand was workers demanded that they uh, be able to withdraw 100% of their GST fund at once, not just the 10% of the total fund in the initial withdrawal as stimulated by the current regulations. So it will be pointless if workers can only withdraw certain 10% of all those funds they have been uh, saving uh, periodically. And also, workers uh, resigned from their jobs should have the same rights as those being laid off uh, in withdrawing their GST uh, fund without delay. So earlier, the government uh, and the Workers' so uh, Social Security Agency uh, defended the new regulation, saying that it was aimed at protecting workers when they retired. So let's say if a worker is laid off and then all of their GST funds are withdrawn at once, then it will be against the law for number 40-2014 on the National Social Security. And this is coming from the Minister Muhammad Hanif Adakiri, coming from the, the also referring to these two articles, which is 35 and 37 of the regulation. Uh, and he also mentioned that uh, laid off workers should not withdraw their pension funds as they would have already been given a severance payment already. But when you think of the other side, or perhaps put yourself on the, the worker's shoes, that as the opposition to the new regulation grew even stronger, the President Jokowi, uh, as well as uh, uh, he summoned the Hanif, as well as the, the, the President Director, uh, to discuss these issues. So for workers who has this contract uh, have been terminated or no longer working for their respective uh, companies, then they can withdraw their uh, GST fund within a month. And also to accommodate the president instructions, the government will revise the new regulation as well. So this comes with a uh, human rights and the workers' rights, but also at the same time, having a look at the national law and the policies when it comes to uh, uh, pension funds, it is very sensitive because, after all, workers uh, need to consider themselves uh, themselves to carry on with their lives and uh, even to have the, the perhaps the certain expectation in case of the emergency or other matters to withdraw the money. But if it becomes more difficult to, to be able to use all those funds they have been saving, where is their right? And perhaps Indonesia really, really needs to look at the human rights and the workers' rights uh, even further. And staying in Indonesia, apparently Jokowi plans a big spending just the next year. So he's planning about 20% annual increase in states spending uh, in uh, 2016 state budget as he looks to spend more on a growth generating infrastructure project. And which is very good news. Indonesia is very well known having for having uh, very poor infrastructures. So this total spending next year will be increased about 2.2 quadrillion uh, rupiah, which is the 164.5 billion US dollars, compared to just uh, perhaps just less than that. And um, Finance Minister Bambang uh, Bronjonoro said after limited cabinet meeting. So for the next year budget, revenues are targeted to hit at least 1.9 quadrillion and compared with the 1.6, a uh, 1.76 quadrillion targeted this year. And their priorities for next year will remain infrastructure, energy, and as well as agriculture. So despite that this recent spike in, in, uh, 
uh, domestic fuel prices. Uh, it is very also important to mention and also highlight that there will be no additional fund allocation for fuel subsi uh, subsidies next year. And uh, the, this nominal amount of capital injection of this uh, for state-owned enterprises will be lower than this year's figure of the 64.8 trillion rupees. And uh, for the next year, capital uh, expenditure spending, which includes the allocations for ministries, investment infrastructure project, will be higher than 290 trillion rupees this year. So a lot of uh, money will be spending on uh, for infrastructure, energy, and agriculture as well. And focusing on infrastructure is uh, very good news in Indonesia, having a huge ge uh, geographical, perhaps the uh, challenges there. But uh, when it comes to build more dams, roads, houses, water facilities, it is very necessary for citizens and also to be able to improve all this lifestyle as well as contributing to uh, economic growth. Uh, of Indonesia. So uh, there is also uh, raising doubts over the government's ability to uh, even to raise enough revenue to fund it. So uh, it is targeted around 8% higher than this year and is already ambitious, very ambitious uh, project. And the government and the House of Representatives apparently they mentioned that they were currently discussing the formulation of all the special policies to prop up state revenues next year. Uh, but apparently it declined to reveal whether it was referring to mutu tax amnesty or policy to pardon past tax the wrongdoings and exchanging for citizens invest, investing their money back into the country. So uh, that's the end of the economic aspect of Southeast Asia, and you are still with Grace. Stay tuned for, th for the next section, which we will be discussing on the social culture part of ASEAN. <music> ASEAN Dailies First and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. You are with Grace at ASEAN Dailies, we deliver news from Southeast Asia. Now we are at the social culture part of ASEAN. But however, let's just move further from ASEAN. And this is regarding Mayweather, uh, who stripped of the WBO title and he won against uh, Pacquiao. He won the title on the May 2nd match against the many, and one of the largest and most profitable fights in the history of boxing. And he had uh, the title revoked because he failed to pay about 200,000 US dollars a sanctioning fee by the deadline of uh, July 3rd, which was just a few days ago. And the WBO requires the boxers to pay 3% of their purse to fight for the world title uh, up to 200,000 US dollars. Mayweather could certainly afford this fee, but he's the, he, uh, definitely he is a multimillionaire and he earned over 220 million dollars from his fight with money. So, the question is, where is the money and how come he's not uh, uh, paying anything uh, for uh, this particular uh, pay that he is supposed to pay? Well, uh, another match will be coming up, uh, so keep an eye on these two. And let's move on to the uh, next uh, topic, which is the climate, climate action uh, plans. How are ASEAN's... I mean, all those countries doing so far. And with only uh, five months before the uh, Paris climate talks, ASEAN countries are stepping up uh, the games, apparently. And then over 900, sorry, over 190 countries will come together uh, in a month of December for the 21st International Climate Conference known as COP21 or Conference of the Parties. So this will be held for two weeks and it is hoped to achieve the new climate agreement aiming to keep global warming below 2 uh, Celsius. So in order to reach this goal, a country must prepare its internationally determined contributions, a list of climate actions government would take post-2020. And also <clears throat> they must decide how countries would reduce the carbon emissions and also to address climate change as well. 
Uh, Singapore is the first and only ASEAN country to comply so far, and it is heavily dependent on the fossil fuels. And it plans to reduce its emission intensively uh, by 36% from its 2005 level by 2030. So to reduce this greenhouse gas uh a footprint in Singapore switched from the fuel oil to natural gas, and also it is cleanest form of fossil fuel effect. But other than that, talking about Singapore, as in the oldest ASEAN effort, where are they? So how are ASEAN countries faring with their oldest uh, climate talks? Five countries presented uh, their progress uh, during the Regional Climate Change Forum which was just held in Bangkok. And Indonesia's major emission source are coal and oil as well. And the country also aims to uh, have more Indonesians use electrical stoves than LPGs or a, even natural gas. And in 2009, just to go back to the, uh, the historic uh, information, the Indonesia already pledged to lower its emissions. But it is still currently being processed and also in the submission hope that in September it can be reduced and um, th uh, like Indonesia Thailand is also still developing and with focus on the energy sector so the government has national committee on climate change policy and it aims to submit uh, INDC by September or October as well and talking about the Vietnam, it also has a lot of CO2 carbon dioxide emission. And Cambodia, <coughs> sorry, to combat this climate change, Cambodia established its National Climate Change Committee in 2006 alongside its policies like Green Growth Roadmap, Adaptation and the Migrant Plan as well. And how about our nation, Malaysia, is amongst uh, fastest growing ASEAN economics and uh, this nation sees as developing low carbon society. So by 2020, it aims to transform into fully developed nations. And uh, Brunei, Laos, and Myanmar really did not report on their progress during this forum. However, it is also expected to submit their uh, reports ahead of this climate talk soon as possible. So yes, that's it for our news on the social culture part of ASEAN. Uh, stay tuned for the next uh, interview uh, with uh, the, this footwear from all the way from the Philippines. So we'll interview, it will be interviewing the co-founder of uh, Behabi Footwear. And as well as we'll be taking a short break. And But please leave us the feedback on our social media channels on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. As well as to visit our website at Durian ASEAN. Come. But when you're on the go and when you don't have the, any access, but you can, you can download our Dream ASEAN app or tune in app and look for us at Dream ASEAN.